Good afternoon and welcome to Smithsonian Gardens. Let's talk gardens. We are thrilled to have you with us today. It's a beautiful day in the mid-Atlantic area and if you are watching this instead of being out in your garden we appreciate your support and I know our speaker is going to appreciate being able to share all the wonderful information she has about her garden. I'm so excited. This is one garden I've never visited. So I'm really excited to learn more about it. My name is Cindy Brown. I'm the education or the manager of education and collections at Smithsonian Gardens. And as I said, we're very pleased to have you with us today. As always, please put your questions in the chat box. Rebecca has told me she has lots of slides to share, but I will stop her at the very end so we might be able to get a, a question or two uh, with her. But she has lots and lots of beautiful images to share with us and good information about native plants, which I know you all are going to love. So without further ado, Rebecca McMacken, I hope I said that right, I forgot to ask you, great, um, please. Tell us more about yourself, your garden, and your gardening philosophies. I'll see you at the end. I'll be back and join you. Have a delightful trip with our participants. Thanks so much. Um, and hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Rebecca, and I manage Brooklyn Bridge Park in Brooklyn, New York. Uh, we're an 85-acre post-industrial brand new park built on reclaimed shipping piers. And it's unusual in that it's built on reclaimed shipping piers, but also in that the park is managed ecologically. We practice what we call ecological horticulture. And so that is what I'm really gonna talk about today more than anything. I'm excited to talk to you about how awesome Brooklyn Bridge Park is, um, but more than anything, um, I'm going to, number one, make the case for why it's important and even critical that we prioritize habitat for wildlife in our cities and in our gardens. And as well, I think really what I'll spend most of my time today on is discussing specific techniques that we've developed or use at Brooklyn Bridge Park, which we're still really in the process of learning and experimenting with. But we're at the point now where we figured out some really important things that we're excited to share, as well as the methods that we've used to learn those things about how to encourage wildlife in the middle of a giant urban park in the biggest city in the entire country. So this is Brooklyn Bridge Park, and it is a massive experiment. As I mentioned, we're a brand new post-industrial park in the middle of New York City, and this is Pier 1 out of many piers. We are in zone 7B, which I hear you all are sort of in as well, um, which is crazy because when I started, we were 6A. I started 10 years ago. Um, and, you know, we're, we're pretty similar, even, even though you're much farther south. I think, uh, you know, coldness wise and heatness wise, we're, we're relatively similar, but we're also really similar in something called ecoregions. And so plant hardiness zones are great when you're just growing plants that come from all over the world. Uh, but when you're really growing native plants, it's important to look at your ecoregions. And these are um, organizations of not just coldness and heat, but also plant communities, geological elements that might, um, you know, orchestrate those plant communities. And you, there's different tiers of them. So we're now at level one and we're both in the same level. We're in um, the Eastern temperate forest. And when you zoom in, you can see that we're, we're pretty much, we're also in the same level two ecoregion, uh, which is the da, 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 U.S. coastal plains. And so a lot of the strategies uh, that we use at Brooklyn Birch Park and even a lot of the plants are also going to be helpful in the D.C. region as well. And if you're not in D.C. or you want to know more about this, you can find information on the EPA's website. And especially if you're gardening ecologically, you can generate plant lists based specifically on your ecoregion, and you can even drill down farther than level two. So this is just a really handy resource. And also to show you that we're like kind of in the same place on the globe. So 
Anyways, our park did not start out as a plant community per se. Uh, one of the ways that we're unique is that it is post-industrial and built on those reclaimed shipping piers. So you can see that these are, if you can see my mouse, um, these are the piers out here. They're over the water. They're built on thousands upon thousands of wooden pilings. And so there's really not a lot we can build up there. But then once you get on the land, um, there's a lot, there's, you know, we're building on land and we build kind of straight up. Oh, we'll look at some of these berms, but these are the piers. Um, this is pier six, pier five, pier four fell into the water, pier three, pier two, pier one. This is the Brooklyn bridge. And then we turn the corner and here's EFF main street. And one whole other section of the park is just outside of the window. So this is just an absolutely massive project, um, that was designed by Michael von Valkenberg and has been under construction for 12 years, and we literally finished it in December. So it's just, it's an amazing thing. It's the largest public works project in Brooklyn since um, the days of Olmsted. So the park I mentioned, it was designed by Michael von Valkenberg and Associates, and they, they do some, some work in DC as well. Um, and this is what it looked like before it was, it was a park. It was these warehouses in Brooklyn. And the community organized and turned it turned it into a park. Um, and now it looks like this. And that means that everything, all the plants, all the soils, everything except for one tree was brought onto the site. We used a lot of reclaimed materials, but everything that is in the park, the soils, the plants, like literally everything except for one tree was just brought on site. And that's really important for when we talk about ecology. As it turns out, the park has been quite a success. We get way more than 5 million people a year between Memorial and Labor Days. And we haven't done that count in years because of COVID. So I'm sure it's much more than that now. We host beautiful and genuinely engaging public art, but it's also a source of constant disturbance and change with construction, with city folks. Um, we're always in motion. The landscape is always changing. And that's what we call in ecology and a disturbance regime. When I said that the park was experimental, I mean that the designers, the contractors, the gardeners were all trying new things. So we have bioswales that catch water and recirculate it for irrigation. And these giant sound attenuating berms that are at one to one grades, they block off the noise of the highway right behind them. As well as the freedom to experiment with unusual strategies when our berms get covered in thistle. But at this point, we're all experimenting and learning together. And you saw that the park is really, really large. It's officially 85 acres, and that includes over 17 acres of garden bed, which doesn't include turf. And so it's well over an acre of just garden space for each of the park's 12 gardeners to manage. So the level of care that each bed gets is really different from a more manicured park. And it's good that the aesthetic is also really wild. And with rare exception, we don't really have gardens. The beds are more architectural. They block wind and create spaces. They define views and they're planted in ways that allow city people to have the experience of exploring a woodland path in a safe and accessible way. The beds are super beautiful, but it's not like people like look at them like on the High Line. Um, and they're, they're kind of like ornamental thickets, which I don't mean in a derogatory fashion because their density makes them perfect habitat for migratory and nesting birds. Birds will look first for structure and only then for food availability when selecting a place to forage or nest. And our park beds are perfect. And that's really important when you look at where we're located. If you look at New York City, Here's us, you know, here's Manhattan, here's us. And just notice all this gray surrounded by all this green. And then as you zoom in, even more gray, right? And so these birds are migrating through these areas, right? This is, it's really critical to provide them with green space to come, to come through. If you look at the green splotches, here's Prospect Park, Greenwood Cemetery, Central Park. And so a bird flying through is gonna look for one of those big splotches. And it's really important because we are located right on the East Atlantic Flyway for bird migration, as are you. And as I'm sure you know, there was a report a couple of years ago that bird populations in North America are down 30% in the last 50 years. And that's more than 3 billion birds just absolutely disappearing. And with that, urban development is on the rise. Currently, more than half of humanity lives in cities. And that number is expected to reach two thirds by 2050 when the UN predicts the world population will hit 9.8 billion. So it's imperative that we figure out ways to fit these animals and their migrations in our cities, right? They're going to come through. It's our choice to make them hospitable 
or harmful, and we take the job of figuring out how to do that very seriously at Brooklyn Bridge Park. But even still, the, per the park is managed first and foremost for people. And even on the Hort team, we prioritize the connections that we facilitate between people and the landscape. But we also have a lot of sports fields and courts. The park offers the ability to not only be near the water, but also get into it and explore the amazing creatures just outside of Manhattan that are in the water. Sometimes our aquatic neighbors even visit us. This is a harbor seal that swam up to the dock a couple of years ago. But in, in addition to all of that, we really do strive to facilitate the visitors meaningful interactions with nature, whether intentional or spontaneous. And we also manage garden beds with the express purpose of fostering biodiversity. That means that the park is, man is made up of mostly but not exclusively native plants. We use only organic management strategies and we specifically seek through research and experimentation to manage garden spaces as wildlife habitat to the best of our ability. And as I mentioned, we don't really have garden beds. So we refer to areas of plants that have specific environmental requirements as ecosystems. And that sounds a bit hokey, but it's really the best word to describe an area like a salt marsh, which we have three of, or our freshwater wetlands that are filled with emergent aquatic plants and collect all the rainwater from the park. We also have what we call ornamental ecosystems, which are made up of really familiar tough plants for playgrounds and park entrances. We have massive wet meadows, tiny dry meadows. We have a ton of meadows. We have over five acres of meadows that are constantly changing. But the majority of the park is comprised of this woodland edge plant mix that we call the dense hedgerow. And when it was originally planted, it was just a bunch of tiny trees and sun loving perennials which grew and grew, and then just completely shaded out all of the sun plants that were underneath of them. And we've had to completely replant a big section of the understory of the park. And it's been a total pleasure, like because right now we have Virginia bluebells blooming in the park. And it's amazing how tough some of our spring ephemerals are, um, like Virginia bluebells. And of course, celandine poppy is incredibly aggressive. This could go on a playground easily. And, and then of course we have little delicate things like this anemonella that is, they have to be grown by caring people. And these are very precious. And we still make sure to create spaces for people to like discover cool things in the park as well. And that's really a massive part of our work which is taking all of these sort of placed plants and getting them into a mature landscape. But the way we manage them is a really different style of gardening than traditional formal horticulture. Traditional formal horticulture is really a lot about control, right? It's a lot about telling plants what to do. When a shrub is placed somewhere or a tree in traditional horticulture, it's most often with the expectation that one could return in 50 years and see it just as they left it, maybe just a little bit larger. And in our landscapes, we allow for movement and growth. We allow for death. We see our gardens more as systems that the Hort team is trying to kickstart so that the natural cycles of the plants can take over and can become more or less self-sustaining or at least self-regenerating given all of our disturbance. And for us, that really starts with the soil. All of our soils are engineered, which means that contractors will take sand, silt, and clay in specific percentages and put in compost and be like, hello, here's soil. Uh, we have over 20 different soil profiles in the park. Most of them were designed by the brilliant T. Fleischer, but the reality is that they're not really soils, right? They lack the structure and the biology and the processes that create a living soil. And urban soils have all kinds of added stressors like compaction and salts. And it's our job to take them and turn them into real soils. So they're not just holding plants upright. They actually need to break down nutrients and cycle those, break down the plant material and then cycle nutrients for, for other organisms. And one of the main tools that we use to do that job are the plants themselves. I'm sure you have all heard of the leave the leaves movement and it's super cool um, and really important because leaves are such a better mulch than anything you can buy in a bag. They're what your plants want to grow in. Your plants put them there to grow in. And there's this funny idea that some people have that deciduous trees will just throw their leaves away in the winter, when in reality, they are carefully placing those leaves over their root systems where the leaves break down and soil organisms can recycle and reintegrate those nutrients over the next season, like a slow motion carbon fountain. The leaves are providing starches and complex molecules. They feed the microorganisms that feed the plants. 
And the plants are using the leaves to build the soils that they want to live in. A lot of gardeners have it backwards, right? We think that we are making the soils for the plants. Um, if you go out into a meadow and you find an early successional tree like a juniper out in the middle of that meadow and you dig a hole underneath of it, you will find pH, soil pH levels that are orders of magnitude more acidic than just 10 feet away from that juniper because the tree is terraforming. The tree is using root exudates and needle castings and all of the tools at its disposal to turn the soil into the environment that it wants to grow in. And thereby other woody plants can then move into that same environment. But that's what plants do is create the environments that they want to live in. They, they build the soils, right? And so at Brooklyn Bridge Park, we are trying to respect those processes and just get out of their way and wherever possible, let them do their thing. We actively look for ways to leave the leaves as well as stems and seed heads and you know, logs and anything else we can leave uh, with it, you know, still looking good. Um, and in our park, this is how it looks in winter. And for us, it totally fits. In a more formal environment, you can put a foot or two of mulch on the front edge and it cleans it all up. Um, that's what Mount Cuba calls a cue to care. And it just lets people know that it's not neglected, it's intentional. And, you know, that straight edge in the front can let you get away with a lot of wildness in the back. I like to think of this as the garden mullet, you know, really neat and clean in the front and party in the back. Um, and it's also really, it's much healthier for the plants um, because those leaves are a weed suppressant and a temperature buffer. And it's still a lot of work, right? It's not no maintenance. We still like have to clean out leaves when there's diseases and we have to map things. So it's still work, it's still gardening. We're not just letting things go, but it's quite different work. And it doesn't work everywhere. In the formal areas, we rake everything out and mulch, but where we can, we do this work. And as I mentioned, the leaves are critical for plant health, but they're also really important for wildlife. Because during winter, if we ever get snow again, within that same layer, that duff layer of leaf litter, live a massive proportion of overwintering insects and other wildlife. Animals like bumblebees and bees and even caterpillars live under a layer of trapped heat that the leaves enclose. The earth heats up and the leaves are right there and they hold the heat. And then if you get six inches of snow on top of that, that little layer is insulated by the snow. It's called the subnivian zone underneath the snow. And it's a very biologically active area that never gets below freezing if you have six inches of snow underneath it. And so if you clear that away, you've not only raked out a bunch of animals, but you also kind of created a tundra or just like a flat plain environment. So this I think is a fascinating slide on the left. Um, what you see is a, a fescue sod that we put down and it's native fescues, but it's just like a flat plain, right? It could be a lawn or a bunch of mulch. It's just like often you find these sorts of environments in nature. And then on the right in this photo is a weedy mess of mugwort and a tangle of weeds. And this is on a warm winter day. And I just think it's interesting because it, to me, it really shows the value of structure as habitat in our gardens, that it's not just about planting native plants. It's also about creating the space, the physical space for these animals to live. Because if you were a beetle, which side of this, of this planting would you live on? The native sedges or the crazy mugwort where you could be under the snow, you could be in an insulated little room hidden from birds. There's just, it's obvious that this, this messiness is conducive to, to wildlife habitat in our gardens. And so we're not gonna let a weedy, you know, hillside go that we can't have that in our park and it doesn't look good for us. Um, but we, again, try to incorporate wildness wherever we can. So um, duff layer overwinterers that we found in our park are of course um, bumblebees um, as well as morning cloaks, which are out and about and bumblebees are out and about as well. Um, this giant polyphemus moth, they have their cocoons. They are dead ringers for leaves. You could never find them if you were looking and you would definitely rake those out if you were raking. Um, this little butterfly is a pearl crescent who overwinters as a caterpillar under the evergreen leaves of their host plant, the smooth aster. And when we do cut back, we make sure not to step on the, on the smooth aster. And as a result, we have hundreds upon hundreds. Our populations of pearl crescents are just extravagant. 
We also have a bunch of birds like this oven bird who only hang out on your land when there's duff to root around in, uh, in the spring and in the fall, because they're looking for insects. The same thing with the swamp sparrow. It's like we're growing these plants to attract insects and growing the insects to attract the birds. And that's important because 95% of bird species in the US feed their young exclusively on insects. And if you've read any of the horrible reports about the insect ap apocalypse, you'll know why this is so important. Because globally, in the last 35 years, entomologists estimate that we've seen an arthropod decrease by 45%. An easier way of saying that is half of insects are gone, right, in 35 years. It's just absolutely wild. And local studies are actually much worse. Uh, there was a German study a couple of years ago that showed flying insects down 75%. And then a study in Puerto Rico, in a pristine forest in Puerto Rico, they had insects down by 60%. And then that was with 50 to 60% of insectivorous animals. And they think that Puerto Rico is due to climate change. So who knows, honestly, what is going to help at this point. But we are going to go out fighting and try to the best of our ability to sustain these ecosystems and even build them when we have to. Sometimes we see our work as like laying the groundwork for work that's going to come in the future. And I'm really glad that we have help in that endeavor, because as much as I would love to be able to tell you that I could identify those two little brown birds, I absolutely cannot. But this is Heather, and she's our resident birder who actually published a book of the 180 birds that she's seen in our park. And she tells us not only which species visit the park, but also where they go and what they do. And we use that information to support birds. So for example, we knew that a certain hillside was incredibly popular with fall migratory birds for the goldenrod seed. So we were able to add a bunch of beautyberry to support their migration and, and give them some fruit as well. But at her suggestion, we planted it after the birds left so that we didn't disturb their migration. And each spring, which we did this year, just a couple of weeks ago, we do a walk with Heather and she gives us like the lay of the land and what birds are doing in the park. And then we take that information and we translate it into our cutback strategy. So we don't follow a lot of rules by rote. We have rules that practices that really change and adapt depending on the various usages and needs of the park. And so last year, Heather identified an area that she saw two white-throated sparrows trying to nest, they were doing their mating call. And we got super excited because that has never happened in New York City before. And so we took that whole section of the park and we just left it. We didn't weed, we didn't plant, we just let it go. Um, and it didn't work, right? They didn't nest, unfortunately, but we tried and we're gonna keep on trying and keep on experimenting with stuff like that. And so, you know, this is what I mean by, uh, by ecological horticulture. It's not just planting native plants or even planting plants for birds. We're looking at species who use the park and looking at how they use the park and how our gardening practices interact with them and then bolstering the resources that they need wherever possible. And sometimes that just means giving them space. And certainly it's a lot of like putting the right plant in the right place. And for us, that's native plants, really loosely defined native plants, although not exclusively. Although it's funny, you know, this idea is still floating around that cities are so different than native ecosystems that only the most aggressive exotics and invasives could possibly live in cities. And I just think that's hilarious because we work with these plants every day and I see plants like, you know, honey locust and panicum just not just thriving, but spreading and out competing weeds. There's very aggressive, very urban adapted uh, plants. And uh, a couple of years ago, uh, we had the good fortune of being able to catalog and collect all of our knowledge of this large team, we're a team of 18 people. Um, the knowledge uh, that we had learned about growing these native plants in our park and created big databases with this knowledge that we've posted online. Um, and uh, there's a spreadsheet of more than 250 native plants that are well adapted for urban conditions that you can that you can download on our website that I think is going to go the link is going to go into the chat and it has a lot of information not only about um, which plants but also how to grow them what their behaviors are what their benefits are so I highly I highly recommend that um, and then let me know if I'm missing anything where these are all living documents so Again, you know, this isn't just planting a plant and walking away. It's about the relationships the plants have with other organisms. Because if you think about, you know, even an echinacea in a classical American garden that's surrounded by a foot of mulch, it's not really an integral part of a system. It's like an animal in a zoo. It needs 
companion plants and pollinator partners and nectar robbers and seed distributors and caterpillars. It's, it's all about those dynamics. So at the park, in order to encourage those dynamics, we of course leave the seed heads up. That's something a lot of us do now, which is wonderful. Uh, but we also try and leave our seed heads up in the spring when a lot of birds are coming through. And that's when a lot of our very rare and even endangered grassland birds expect the seeds in our grasslands is in the spring. So in certain areas, we push cut back as late as possible to encourage those birds to use, um, use the seeds. But in other areas where Heather, the bird lady, thinks that the birds might nest, we do cut back super early so that we're not disturbing animals that might nest in the park. So it's a lot more complicated than things you might see around like cut everything back after temperatures hit 55 degrees, which is, it's so cool that that stuff is out there and that people are thinking like that and it goes viral on Facebook. It's amazing. But the sorts of work that we do is to try and foster real observation, real connection with all of these organisms. And then, then our practices can adapt and evolve over time rather than just following static rules. But those rules are really helpful to get started. And when we do cut back, we actually inspect the seed heads and uh, see if they're viable. And if they are, we collect them. And then um, we place them back. Um, in the garden to either seed in or so that animals can still eat them. And it sounds really labor intensive, but we've, we've gotten pretty good at it. Um, we found that asters, goldenrods, and all of their relatives maintain most of their seeds, uh, things like penstemon as well. And that makes sense because both Xerxes Society for, for Pollinators and the Audubon Society for Birds put asters and goldenrods on the tops of their lists consistently for both birds and pollinators. So they're just powerhouse plants in so many ways. And if you don't want to or can't leave your duff on the ground, one thing that I do at home is I take all the seed heads, especially the ones that are pretty, and I chop them at the base and stick them into the garden and make these pretty little arrangements so that birds can still have access to them. I call them bird bouquets. And this is our new big idea, which is don't cut back. You know, a lot of our horticultural practices, a lot of the times we learn to do them because it's just what other people did. And often those other people lived in England 400 years ago and kept topiary. So we try now to interrogate traditional garden practices and ask why those things are necessary. Certainly some of the things we do are, are necessary, right? Like some things do need to get cut back for cleanliness or safety, or it just looks that much better. But where we can, it really benefits everyone to find areas that we can leave untouched, like the backs of beds or places that already look pretty and don't need to cut, cut back, like hedgerows. We found that sedges, like the Carex volcanoidea, the fox sedge in the front of this picture, never need to get cut back. And they actually look pretty awkward when you do cut them back. And we want to normalize this. We want to normalize this aesthetic. We want to make it acceptable to people. I think it took Peter Dolph to make native plants acceptable in the United States by making them like the chicest plants in Europe, which is still happening if you saw any of the, of the garden shows this year. Um, but we want to then, you know, make people appreciate what the landscape looks like naturally. And yes, this is a very intentional and curated natural, right? We're in a super fancy park, but it can still serve the purpose of shifting people's perspective as from this being messy and neglected to acceptable or even beautiful. And then that allows us to have gardens that can function as habitat by essentially being left alone. I read a paper a few years ago out of St. Louis about how the income of a neighborhood can affect pollinator abundance. And they found that the less money people had, the more pollinators they had, because of course they were not gardening or managing their landscapes. And so oftentimes we are the most disturbance that our gardens receive. We are the deterrent to uh, quality habitat in the garden, us well-meaning well gardeners. And so of course, knowing that we are not going to just stay out of our garden beds and let them go, but we are going to look for places that we can add in pockets of minimal disturbance. And we found amazing things as a direct result of that. So this is in one section of the garden called the flower field. And the gardener there, Bella, read that the rose mallows, hibiscus mashudos, they uh, supported dozens of species of lepidopterans, of birds and moths, and some of them were boring into the stems. And when we cut them back, um, we're removing all of those animals. And so she came to me and she asked if it was okay if she could leave the stems up in the spring. And I said, you know what? I think that's not going to look good. I think that's going to be crossing the line and it'll just look neglected. And she said, let me just try and I'll edit. And then if it doesn't look good, we'll chop it down. And 
when I look at this, I think this is gorgeous. I think it's modern. I think it's evocative. I think it's, I just think it's next level and it's silver and pretty. So even from an aesthetic perspective, I think it's just rocking right on. But then Bella finds this at the base of those hibiscus and it is a song sparrow nest. Um, and, and it's literally nestled into those stems. She's never seen this in her many years in the garden. And then two weeks later, Heather takes this photo of, of this baby song sparrow that came out of that nest that Bella like facilitated this actual baby bird because she was um, not cutting back those hibiscus. So even if it's not your cup of tea, right? That aesthetic, how amazing that you can uh, support these amazing animals just by um, adding more space for that kind of stuff in the garden. And then this is a red winged blackbird uh, female at, um, at the wetlands in Brooklyn Bridge Park. And this was an area where it took years for them to nest. They tried nesting a few years and couldn't nest. And then finally they started nesting in the park and it was a big victory. And the gardener Pavel there did not cut back his front, front border. And I said, Pavel, it is too messy. I just think that this is crossing the line and we just have to cut it back. And he sent me this video of this mama red winged blackbird building her nest using these strips of fibers from milkweed. And it turns out that all milkweed is renowned among birds for their nest making material. They like Orioles will create beautiful nests uh, with this, like these long, really strong fibers that some people think also have chemical properties that you know, keep away the various pests that might go after uh, baby birds. And so again, maybe it's not the front of your border. Maybe you can't find space for like a wild, messy milkweed um, patch at the front of your border in spring, but I bet in the back, there's a place that you can leave these stems up and make, make room for these animals to, um, to use your garden beds as well. And a few years ago, I found this weedy aster in the flower field and I didn't know what it was. And I almost had the crew pull it, but we have a rule that you're not allowed to pull plants unless you can identify them. And so I posted it online and it turns out that it is the state threatened salt marsh aster, which we've now moved to our salt marshes and where it is thriving. So again, just like amazing stuff, just by like leaving it alone, not having as much control, trying to facilitate systems rather than completely orchestrate them. This is one of the park's older gardeners. Uh, he's now a park ranger, but when he was a gardener, he um, had this Katie did that he was holding in his hand and they make the ch -ch 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 sound that you hear at night and they lay their eggs on twigs and perennial stems that we leave on the ground. And this is a differential grasshopper that calls in our grasslands. And we didn't used to have these animals. And honestly, we didn't even notice that they were missing. But then one day the grasshoppers started calling and the crickets started singing and we had the katydids at night and it just completely transformed the park because the animals are integral to the park experience for people. They give us those auditory cues that trigger relaxation or memory. And they say, this is what a summer night sounds like. We practice a lot of the more well-known strategies to attract wildlife as well, like planting the earliest spring flowering plants we can like pussy willows, or Carolina Silverbell. They do the critical job of providing food for awakening queen bumblebees. We have a bunch of them flying around now. The bumblebees, when they wake up, they sort of zoom around really low to the ground looking for a nest. And then when you see them visiting flowers, that's when you know they've found a nest site and they're starting to provision it. So, and a full 30% uh, percent of those queen bumblebees don't make it through hibernation because they don't have the stored up energy reserves to, to make it through. So we also plant as many late blooming flowers as possible to provide them with the pollen that they need to properly overwinter. We plant, oh, this is, a, speaking of asters and goldenrods, in this photo, there's literally five species of goldenrod, all native to Long Island. We also plant a lot of berries for birds like winterberry, bayberry. John has even started drilling holes in old wood uh, for bees like this leafcutter bee. We also leave a lot of rotting stumps and snags around in beds and, and John also inoculated them and it's, they're working now, it's amazing to see. Um, and now we have like amazing little um, green metallic bees that nest in rotting wood. And we didn't used to have those bees either, but now we've provided them the home. We do try and hide the rotting wood from people. We try and keep it. No one's complained yet, but uh, we're always pushing that boundary. 
But of course, building up all this biodiversity brings in wildlife that we don't want as well. So these are oleander aphids and they came in on imported oleander and then jumped out to milkweed, unfortunately. And how we deal with this really common pest is another big difference from even organic gardening and ecological horticulture. Because in our park, rather than try to maintain a sterile environment, which what is that anyways, really? Like it's in the dirt. It's not, you can't have a sterile environment. What we do is we seek to build up biology so that the pests just stay in check. So of course, if you think about it, when you plant a plant, you've created a vacuum. You, you have a resource for herbivores and they're gonna come in and they're gonna eat that plant. And after there's enough herbivores there, you're gonna attract predators and the predators are gonna come in and start balancing those herbivores. And if you keep on wiping out the herbivores, you never build up the numbers of the predators that are necessary for keeping those herbivores in balance. One of my friends says that um, predators and people tend to notice pests at the same time. And so, um, and so we will wipe things out right when the predators are like moving in there. So with these oleander aphids, what we do here is first we look for predators before we're gonna take any action. And you see here that these aphids are brown little balloons and they are parasitized by an aphid wasp. And this little wasp has laid her eggs inside the, inside the aphid. And in just a few days, those, those baby wasps are going to hatch out and mate and then lay their eggs in dozens upon dozens of other aphids and then eventually keep those populations in check. This is me standing in a, in a section of swamp milkweed in the park. And just in one section, not moving, taking my iPhone, you can see lacewing eggs, lacewing larvae, flower fly larvae, ladybug larvae, all within this one little section. And so even if we're using like hort oil or something, um, we're still going to be wiping out those beneficial insects as well. We've occasionally done, especially in the beginning of the park when it was really, really, it was sterile. Um, we've done some releases of things like lace wings, but we really try not to do releases because of the historical and current issues with you know, spreading invasive species, spreading diseases, you know, harvesting from wild populations. Generally, it's really a better idea to attract um, animals rather than uh, try and buy them and, um, and release them. And sometimes we get problems that we can't solve, right? Like cedar, quince rust, lana, and melanchiers. We have, we don't do anything. We just let it go, right? And then we even practice tough love. If a plant is dying, we don't want to keep it on life support. This is, it's not that like a cherry LA, right? We have the luxury of these really high thresholds. Um, and I can convince myself that these taxodium midge galls are actually super ornamental and they allow us to tell stories and to show, you know, these various interactions to people in the park as well. There's some real upsides to them. And we've had really great successes with these strategies so far. This is one of our many catalpa trees that gets absolutely covered with aphids in the summers. And we were originally encouraged to spray them for the aphids, and of course we didn't. And one day, after telling a bunch of volunteers about the various ladybugs of New York, one of them leaves this on my desk. And it is the two-spotted lady beetle that hadn't been seen in New York City in 30 years. And I'm happy to say that now we have them all over the park and they seem pretty stable. And the thing about this beetle is that it's teeny tiny and it eats these teeny tiny aphids on the catalpa. And if we had sprayed those aphids, of course, we would have wiped out the beetle. Of course, we also do some more experimental work to attract wildlife in the park. A lot of it happens in our flower field, which is a solid half acre of wildflowers. And it has these massive swaths of flowers and they're wonderful to, for attracting butterflies just to drink nectar from. But we also have a huge number of host plants of ver for various species. And so this is a monarch on a lot of one of our, our many, many milkweed plants because butterflies can pick up the volatile organic compounds from their host plants from very far away. So a monarch can tell not only that you have milkweed, but they can also tell how much milkweed you've planted. And so we have an extravagant uh, number of monarchs in, in a good year. This is from 2018. Unfortunately, we haven't had uh, good numbers of monarchs uh, since 2018, but hopefully we'll get there again. Um, we also, of course, are not just supporting them as they travel through the park. We are supporting their breeding by having um, having the milkweed in the park. And of course, when you're planting host plants, 
uh, it is very critical to not to make sure that they do not have systemic insecticides because that will literally harm or kill the animals that you are trying to support. A native plant with systemic insecticides is like a poison apple. So we, especially with, with host plants, we need to make sure that we don't, we don't do that. Um, we also stock our butterflies. This is Pavel. And in 2018, we tagged over 300 butterflies as they migra migrated to Mexico. And of course, in order to do this work, we have to know which animals visit our garden. And so we've worked with the Natural History Museum and the Wildlife Conservation Society as college and well as colleges to do these big bio blitzes. But more and more, we're just doing this work ourselves. And we use iNaturalist in order to collect our wildlife observations. I highly, highly recommend that people download and get familiar with iNaturalist. It's incredibly useful. And then we use that information to create our gardening practices. Um, and then we put it in databases. Um, we, and we have these on our website. We have one for bees, one's for uh, butterflies and moths, one for birds, all about which not only the host plants, but also their life cycles in the park, um, elsewhere in the region, do they migrate? Um, all of the information we could gather on the animals that we've seen the park in the park are, is available on our website that you can, you can download if you're interested in doing this work as well. Um, this is Bella. She's the gardener for the flower field, and she has a tiny carpenter bee that she found during a survey. And we worked with Heather Holm to, of course, like many people do now, make what Heather calls stem stubble um, and leave those stems up for, um, for bees. And it's cool to see, again, how fast this went from being like, oh, super ugly to normal American garden aesthetic that is now um, like it's acceptable. And honestly, you only really see it for a couple weeks anyways. And this kind of stuff is really important because, you know, we have bumblebees in the park. Uh, they're wonderful and uh, we want to support them. And um, we know that they tend to nest at the base of bunch grasses. That's like one of the, or sorry, um, they nest there, but they also overwinter and their hibernacula is a new word that I learned. Um, but they, um, they nest at the base of bunch grasses. So this is our uncut back little blue stem here. And there's arguably possibly a bumblebee nesting in there. And then this is our normal cutback strategy over here, which really chops away the nesting location for those bumblebees. And so knowing the life cycle of that bee, we leave the skirts on. So we're still chopping back the top of the little blue stem so it doesn't rot. And then leaving these little skirts on so that we're not disturbing the bee habitat. And again, I actually think this looks a lot better than this in reality. And that's important because a couple of years ago, Pavel found the great golden bumblebee in the park. And this is an S1 critically imperiled animal in New York state. And it's amazing that this animal lives in the middle of the biggest city in the country. And not only that, but this animal actually likes cities. If you look at the iNaturalist distribution here, you can see that big population in New York city, big population in Philly as well. And there's a new paper coming out that shows that cities can act as safe havens for bees like Bombus fervidus, who are very sensitive to the pesticides used in suburban and rural areas, as well as the diseases from managed bees, which is fascinating because we're so used to thinking of cities as ecologically destitute, but that is simply not true. We're just really different and we can even be a refuge for certain species. We're also thrilled that Pavel found the blueberry digger bee this spring. And this is a bee that is pretty common, but not in cities. It's very rare in cities because they need to feed their young blueberry pollen and blueberries like acidic soils that don't often uh, happen in cities. And so this is really exciting because it's a specialist. And when you have animals and plants that are specialists and can support them in cities, that's really exciting. We've also found the first stick bugs that have been seen in Brooklyn in absolute decades. And again, not super rare, but very rare in New York City. We occasionally take a slightly more heavy handed approach uh, to our work. Um, we are overrun with praying mantids from all over the world. And we have one native one, the Carolina mantis. And we find the invasive ones by finding these piles of monarch wings underneath them. And so after reading about Mount Cuba's efforts and checking in with certain gardeners, Bella and Pavel started calling the invasive 
mantis egg casings out of the garden. And they made this handy guide, which is um, also download downloadable um, from the uh, website. And so you can see which of those egg casings you find in your garden are native um, or exotic and make a decision. Sometimes we've heard of people donating the egg casings to bird sanctuaries um, who will then feed the birds uh, delicious, nutritious food. Um, and, um, and so, yeah, um, we've seen as a direct result, we think uh, the Carolina mantid populations really flourish in the park. Um, of course, we generally don't do work like that. More of our ecological work is, is pretty subtle. Um, we want hummingbirds, so we plant all of the red and yellow tubular flowers that we know that hummingbirds will visit um, in the park. And it took, gosh, like seven years, uh, but just a couple of years ago, I saw my first hummingbird in the park and it's just absolutely amazing to do all this work to encourage them and then see them go to the flowers that you've planted specifically for them. And they're just flying through right now. They're not actually staying in the park, but we want them to nest there, right? We want to help support their, um, their reproduction. And so um, we leave up the seed heads. This is Anemone virginiana, the tall thimbleweed and the, the hummingbirds will use the silks on the thimbleweed, the same as um, milkweed silks, they'll also use that in order to line their tiny little magical nests. And so again, why would you cut this back? If you can make a resource for hummingbirds to use in nesting material, it's just absolutely wonderful. Um, we've also had incredible discoveries, like this is a hawk moth, a uh, clearing hawk moth that is pollinating a Minerta fistulosa. And I'm pretty convinced, even though others are not, that this is the pollinator partner for this plant. And that's really important because it means that this plant actually gets to have sex and reproduce sexually and mutate and evolve over time. And eventually will like have a, you know, locally adapted strain of Minerta fistulosa in the park. And that's, that's really important because Evolution is how plants stay in the same place because climate is always changing, right? And plants can't move. And so they need to be able to adapt by reproduction, by random mutation and sexual selection and all of that. And so, um, and so when you have this cycle of pollinator partner and plant, that's how you support them. And then of course we wanna support this pollinator. And so we make sure that we also have the um, host plant, which is coral berry, for that clear wing hawk moth as well. And so we're completing those cycles in the park. Um, so to wrap up, um, it's important not to just know like these specific insects and these specific plants, um, but the process by which we learn uh, how to support these organisms because DC is gonna have different plants and different animals. Arizona is gonna have way different plants and different animals. So it's more important to figure out how to do this work rather than just take our strategies. Although please take the strategies and then tell me what strategies we should, we should use as well. Um, but the way that we do this is like Pavel a couple of years ago found this butterfly in the park and posted it onto iNaturalist. And I had an alert set up and I got it. And I spent like five minutes doing research and found that it was um, called the common city wing and it wasn't super common. Um, and its host plant is lamb's quarters. And lamb's quarters is a weed. And so instead of just leaving the weeds, we looked through the weeds, pulled out the eggs, hatched them out, and released them back in the park, getting our work done, but minimizing the harm. We did the same thing for this American lady butterfly. We, found, we had them in the park, we researched their host plant, planted it in abundant numbers. And this is us trying to plant these plants in Annapolis, literally having to brush the caterpillars off to um, in order to uh, get them to um, get the plants in the ground. It's absolutely incredible. So just to finish off, and here's one in a, in a flower. They're so amazingly cute. And here's the link to the website, which hopefully will be in the chat. You can also uh, follow the Brooklyn Bridge Park uh, Instagram account. Uh, they have a, a ton of info there and follow my Instagram account as well. I also post that stuff and sign up for my newsletter which I always post a lot of resources. We have a new guide coming out this weekend on um, mulching that I'm really excited for that I'll post there as well. So to finish up, um, I just wanna be really clear that the only reason that we were able to do this work is because of this amazing, passionate and motivated work crew. 
is the work of a bunch of people working together. And a lot of this information was collected by them. And it can't be done. This isn't work that can be done by a contractor visit once a month. It takes time and investment and goodwill. And we get to do that as a park because we value the horticulture staff and we let them follow their interests wherever possible. We're not a perfect employer by any stretch of the imagination, but we genuinely try to be a good place to work. And that sounds super obvious, but in an environment where manual labor has been systematically and strategically devalued, it's actually pretty radical to say you're important and you're doing valuable work. And I feel really fortunate to be able to say that because I worked in places where that wasn't the case and we would never be able to do the kind of work that we do now because you just can't order someone to chase around a butterfly, but you can educate them and inspire them and then give them space to follow their own interests. You might wonder why we focus so much on butterflies. Um, I personally prefer moths, but butterflies are a gateway insect and they so clearly and beautifully illustrate the possible functionality of our gardens. And the reality is that everyone wants them around, but you just don't get butterflies without the caterpillars and you don't get the caterpillars without the host plants. And you don't need to pick between the butterflies or the people, because as mentioned, we get more than 5 million people at the park each year and almost none of them have any idea that this work is going on. The wildlife and the people all fit together seamlessly. So after all those pretty pictures, I like to end on this one because everything you just saw was built on what was essentially a bunch of empty parking lots, which is ridiculous given how much easier it would be if you're working in real soils. Um, but no matter where you start from, we're all gonna need to do more of this work as the planet gets developed and the climate changes because um, a lot of people might say that this is just you know mopping the deck on the Titanic, but it actually really gives me hope that we can use horticulture to help solve some very serious, very big ecological problems that we face right now. And we can do it literally with flowers. So thank you all so much. I don't know if I've used up the question time, um, but uh, I had so much information. I had to pack in there. I couldn't, I couldn't stop. I agree. And so do the audience. So thank you very much, Rebecca. That was terrific to see the work how much you've changed uh, what you started out with. So thank you for that. And we do have a couple of questions I'd love to be able to ask. Um, how do you feel about, we, you mentioned lamb's quarters, which is edible, so make a good salad out of it. Um, so that's something that uh, one of my previous uh, directors taught me. But what about dandelions? What about some of the more common weeds that we recognize? Uh, uh, what do you do with those? So we, uh, we tend to have a um, pretty lax um, relationship with weeds that are not aggressive invasives. Um, so things like, you know, speedwells and chickweeds, you know, we get to them when they're becoming an issue, but otherwise we really try and outcompete them. Um, dandelions, I, I have like a personal vendetta against dandelions, although I love them and they're wonderful. Mm -hmm. um, but I also uh, want to push back against this common narrative that they are good uh, for pollinators because um, the, the nutrients that they provide to pollinators is not, not comparable to the nutrients provided by native plants. And they also have a liliopathic pollen, um, a liliopathic meaning that it has chemicals in it that suppresses other hormones and other plants. And what they do, they found that trout lily that's, you know, proximate to dandelions, um, they will not set seed at a healthy rate because of the dandelion pollen. And so if you're in a natural system, like you should remove your dandelions. If you are going to remove them by spraying a bunch of toxins on the ground, let them go. Please do not <laughs> spray the toxins on the ground. It's never worth it to do that. Um, but I also think that this sort of like gung-ho dandelion movement that is so, so popular needs to just chill out a bit. And we, no one needs to be angry and like trying to kill dandelions that doesn't help. And it doesn't make any sense. Um, but, um, but we just try and, you know, with everything, we're always trying to just keep a balance, a good balance of, of things. Okay. Great. So here's a, here's a little bit more complex one. Does soil get washed away by the rain and weather since you're extended out over the water? Um, how do the, the plants stay in place uh, if, it, if it gets washed away? And how much maintenance needs to be done? Because what you're talking about may not be the typical maintenance like you see in the garden behind me right now, but 
it's maintenance. So how much is done? Uh, you showed your staff how many how, and do they work full time? So we have right now uh, 14 full time gardeners in the park um, and each one gets a zone. So like one peer is a zone. Right. Um, so it's too much work for that person. And we also have seasonal gardeners and volunteers and contractors occasionally as well. Um, but looking at your background, I can assure you that it is half, if not less, of the work that goes into a traditional, formal, horticultural display. Um, we just don't fuss. And that's kind of part of the um, part of the ethos, right? It's just like, we're facilitating, <laughs> right? We're just like making everything happy, but we're not going to control it. Um, and if some plants want to run around, we'd let them run around. We will edit, um, but it is significantly less work. Okay. You mentioned you have 5 million visitors, give or take, uh, and you're like, we have about 20 million visitors. And I know what a challenge it is to protect the areas from the visitors. How do you do it? So one of the best designs that MVVA has ever done, and it is definitely the least appreciative, is their fences. They make wonderful, invisible fences with these thin um, wires that run between beautiful wooden posts. And what they, and then we allow the plants to grow through, which is always their intent as well. And so it lets people feel uh, like the plants are accessible. It's not like our parks department is consistently putting like black iron spiky fences in front of gardens and that there's just such a psychological and aesthetic barrier between the gardens you don't you're not connected to them but in our park it kind of feels like you're walking through the woods when plants are are flowing through those fences and that really allows compaction to stay at a minimum and that I was a gardener in a massive uh um the populated Manhattan park called Washington Square Park uh, for years, and we couldn't grow a tenth of the plants that we grow at, at Brooklyn Bridge Park simply because of soil compaction. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that we, we don't really have a lot of fences up, but we do subtle suggestions on don't walk here, stay on the path. And Which will help the good people, right? The yeah. good people will pay attention. But yeah. There's a whole cohort of people that, yeah. yeah. Our magnolias are so popular, we catch people climbing in them and we keep saying, not a good idea. That's really not helpful, but totally. it's not always appreciated when uh, the information is shared. Talking about sharing information, uh, inter we have interpretive panels. Uh, mm -hmm. Right now, we have a huge campus-wide exhibition called Habitat, which you know about. In yep. fact, we really appreciate uh, what you're saying because it backs up what, why, what we have on our interpretive panels. Do you have interpretive panels to let people know about what you're doing and what they're looking at? So we've been really focused for the last decade on construction. The park has been being built for, for that amount of time. And so education and outreach was really minimal. Although sometimes we would do interpretive signage. We even have like QR codes and stuff like that. But I don't think that it's on the level that it um, that we really want to see it get to. And I'm hopeful that now that the park is completed, that we'll be able to start more in, with interpretation. Because as I mentioned, like people have no idea that any of this is going on. And I think it would be a really enriching experience for park visitors, even if they were just there for basketball to know what was actually happening. Um, but at the same time, like every garden, you know, having a sign is, is like a, it is also a way that puts a distance between people and the landscape. And, uh, and, and if it's like a physical distance or an intellectual distance, our goal is really about connection. Mm -hmm. Very good. Well, thank you. It is just about time, but I, that's something you said that I really want you to reiterate is the fact that you encourage, not just allow, but encourage your staff to take notes, take information down. And when we get asked, what is the best thing to do to learn how to be a better uh, gardener or better naturalist? We always say observations and writing. So tell us more about what your staff does uh, in that sure. What a, what a fun thing to talk about. Thanks for asking that. I, I always feel so fortunate. You know, I was an academic before um, getting becoming a gardener, and I always feel like gardening is applied science, right? We're like experimenting, and if it's successful, we keep doing it. Uh, we don't have to publish anything. It's awesome. Um, but we really get to 
uh, just sit around observing things all day. And a lot of these animals and even plants, the knowledge is so limited about their behaviors and reproduction strategies and what supports them. And, and certainly with ecological horticulture, like the books are just getting written. Like people don't know um, how to do this work quite yet. Everyone's figuring it out collectively. And so as observers, we take that job really seriously, right? We wanna learn as much as we can and then share it as, as widely as we can. And so a big thing that people use is iNaturalist. That is just an amazing, not just identification tool, it's one of those AI magical, take a photo and it tells you whatever it is, uh, tools, but it also catalogs it in a way that you can do searches to see if there is this specific moth in your area. What flowers does that moth visit in June? You can do a search on iNaturalist. It's an amazingly helpful um, resource for, for doing this kind of work. Um, but more than anything, you know, I always fall back on the words of um, Robin Wall Kimmerer because she is an indigenous bryologist who has sort of straddles the scientific and um, indigenous uh, viewpoints of um, science and nature and gardening. And she said that, you know, Western uh, sort of science likes to learn about plants. We're reading books, we're looking at studies, et cetera, et cetera. And from the indigenous perspective, you are learning from plants. Mm -hmm. And that's what guides my work entirely, is just this idea that, uh, that you are, you are humbling yourself and just, you know, being like, tell me what you need that we're just trying to make everybody happy, right? We're trying to make, figure out how to facilitate all these organisms living a happy life um, in, in this crazy post-industrial park in the middle of New York City. Mm -hmm. Beautifully said, thank you, thank you. And I will share the chat with you because you got a lot of positive, positive comments. And I know we all need to hear the information that you're telling or sharing with us and you need to hear back from us. So. Thank you for today. Thank you, Rebecca, for all your information and the work that you are leading with that fabulous team that you have. And I wish you all a terrific summer and we'll get back to you soon. Thank you so much for having me, Cynthia, and everyone else. Take care. Thank you. Bye-bye.